Lovely. So welcome everyone to the Yorkshire Natural History Museum. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm the museum coordinator at the weekends here at the YNHM. Uh, this is a repeat lecture. We have done uh, my display on mushrooms uh, before, but it went over very well last time, so we're now repeating it so it can be recorded. Uh, so, obviously at the YNHM, our focus is paleontology, but I am the current exception on the team. My master's degree is in conservation ecology, so I, my domain is living things, which is good because I come here for a holiday because everything's already extinct and I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> But uh, this week we are looking at secrets of the hidden kingdom, or you know, more scientifically known as the fungi kingdom. So I just go to the next slide here. So just par for par basics: what is a mushroom and what is a fungus? So the mushroom is only a sporing body or a fruiting body of a much larger organism that resides in the soil, which is the entire fungi. That's why mushrooms are seasonal; they're like apples, basically, for fungus. So some will uh, only appear for three days a year and then die back again. Some are around for weeks or months. It is a massive kingdom. It's the third kingdom after plants and animals and probably the oldest kingdom of the three, which is always very exciting. So they're actually, this is always surprises people. People assume they're more closely related to plants because they are a rooted organism. They grow out of the soil. They don't move around to find food. Whereas actually fungi are more closely related to animals, which always throws people off a little bit. Uh, I will get into the details as to why they're closer to the animal kingdom than the plant one in a few slides. But for the moment, we'll quickly have a look at mushroom age. So this is the map we have outside as a poster as well. It's in the building, a basic map of time on Earth that includes living organisms, goes back about 650 million years. Uh, would anyone like to take a quick guesstimate as to when do we think fungi first evolved on this timeline? <laughs> no, see, I do get, I do get some people that I can, yeah, five hundred, yeah, well, that's a good, good trout, definitely, yeah. Uh, so, the current oldest living fungus on the planet is a honey mushroom fungus from Oregon, USA. We are guesstimating that this fungus, which is lovely, has a lovely like honey, honey sort of sap colour. We're guesstimating it's between 2,000 and 8,500 years old, this fungus, and it stretches over 10 kilometers in Oregon, which is absolutely insane. We have this one just here, and these wonderful things. So this mushroom uh, in the middle here, so this one's obviously right at the top, quaternary period, 8,000 years within human evolution. So this is the youngest but currently oldest mushroom on the planet. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. Gondwanocytes magnificus, just here, comes from the mid-Cretaceous, was found in Brazil. This is the oldest evidence of a sporing body fossil we have on the planet at this point in time, which is actually wonderful evidence, because if it's been here in the Cretaceous, it will have likely evolved earlier than that. So we know there would have been sporing bodies prior to that, but until we find another one, say, a few million years down the line, that's currently the oldest example of a traditional mushroom. And these wonderful things just here, which most people would not recognize as mushrooms as we know them today. These are essentially mushroom stalks. They would have been about six meters tall when they first evolved there. And what's really interesting is, if we're going to go this in order, so we've got the beginning of life in the late Protozoic, the Cambrian, all of life currently is in the oceans. There's nothing on land at this point in time. Once you get into the Ordovician Silurian, you're starting to get the first land plants, you're starting to get uh, mosses and the first evidence of lichens and lichens fill up here. And then in that you have these mushroom stalks. So the plants that were evolving at this stage are more like ryegrasses, so very uh, woody, sort of like waxy stems, very small root balls, and they're not very similar to what you'd see. There's no trees, for example, at this point in time. Uh, so the mushrooms here are exploiting the fact that there are no tall trees. There's a gap in the ecological niche. Mushrooms are going, hmm, our spores dispersed by the wind in the lack of many animals that would reach this height. So it would be advantageous to us to grow very tall so the wind can blow our spores further away and we can spread out some more. That's the current theory as to why we have such tall mushroom stalks but no mushroom caps currently. We don't think they'd evolve by that point in time. Is everyone with me so far? Yep, yeah, 
grand. So as a point where we're fungi first evolved, we're actually looking much older than 650 million years. We are looking in the cryogenian, around about here-ish. So the oldest fossils of fungi come from the Antarctic. They are estimated to be about a billion years old. And they would have first evolved in the snowball Earth period of the cryogenian, hence its name, when literally all of Earth was covered in ice down to about a hundred span of miles around the equator at this point, where it would have been more slush than ice ball. And that's where life sort of like clung and basically began around about a billion years ago. So there we go. They're older, older than much everyone actually thinks, the kingdom of fungi. And a special shout out goes as well to. Lichens and lichens, of which I can never seem to decide how I'm pronouncing it, so you get both for this lecture. <laughs> so when people look at, I'm going to call them lichens from now on. When people look at lichens, they are, they're looking at this going, what is this? It looks like it came from space, basically. Lichens are what I like to call a shotgun marriage uh, between algae and fungi. So lichens occur when the environment is too harsh for one or the other to survive by themselves. It's maybe too harsh and too cold for the algae. And maybe the fungi can't find a good place to properly root in and sort of like start going with life as they would like to. By having a symbiotic relationship, so the algae at this point are the, we'll call the photobionts. They're producing photosynthesis, producing energy. And then the fungi sort of form a protective shell for the algae to be safe inside, make an equalizing temperature and sort of have a stable place. And then the two exchange nutrients. So as the photobionts, photosynthesis, do their thing, produce sugars, the fungi go, oh, lovely, thank you. We'll provide some shelter, maybe some phosphorus and nitrogen in the meantime. So when you're looking at a lichen, you're looking at a partnership. And some of these things are insanely well adapted to extremes. So if you go to the dry valleys of Antarctica, you will find absolutely no life there bar lichens and bacteria and some very, very base mosses. It is the driest environment on Earth. It hasn't rained in the dry valleys for about 2,000 years. And yet lichens persevere. It's actually about 100 species of lichen that NASA put into space on the International Space Station to see how they would deal with it. And they came back to Earth happy as Larry. So... <laughs> If we were ever colonizing Mars, uh, lichens are probably the way we're going to figure out how we're going to do that. We're going into traditional fungi and what we have specifically here in the UK for the next slide. These are some of my favorites. This is by no means a complete list. The fungal list is many hundreds of thousands of species. Uh, so all of these bar devil's fingers, I included that just because I love this particular mushroom. That is a pure personal choice. Devil's fingers are found in New Zealand. Everything else here can be found in the British Isles, which most people uh, would not think to look at them. So when we're looking for mushrooms, it's important to note that of all fungi on the planet, there is difference between micro and macro fungi. So micro is obviously that we can't traditionally see, which is primarily the most successful is yeast. So yeast for your breads, your gut bacteria, on any patch of your scalp, there's going to be about 600 species of microfungi because we live in partnership with them with our gut biomes and our skin. So when actually a single, it's actually technically impossible to call yourself an I because every single organism on Earth, including us, is a we. We, are, we have many things that make living on Earth possible. We couldn't digest without these fungi, so we are very much enmeshed. Uh, macrofungi is what you're looking at here, a visible, touchable, pickupable organism. And only 10% of those macrofungi actually produce a mushroom. Most of them reside in the soil and don't have a visible sporing body. So we're really getting into the niche stuff here, even though IDing fungi is an absolute nightmare. So never ever touch or eat what you find in the woods if you're not 100% sure what it is. I'm sure that goes without saying. So going into probably, here we are. Yeah, there we go. So this is why I explain why they're closer to animals rather than plants. So obviously it's got the root system we have here. We would recognize of oh, a plant, it doesn't wander around, it's stuck in the same place. However, they don't contain, they don't contain the uh, form of lingon, which is what makes a plant lingon, is what makes the woody and stem textures of a plant. It's a very tough uh, cell, it's actually very difficult to break down. They actually contain chitin, which is the same material that crustaceans and insects use to make their shells, which is why if you poke a mushroom, thank you, it's sort of like poking flesh a little bit in my experience. Uh, it feels more like an actual animal skin rather than a woody or a plant one. 
And then in terms of its root system, these are actually called hyphae, mycelium. Think of them as great giant nerve endings, digestive systems that exude into the soil and combine up to form a visible mushroom. But the hyphae in mycelium is the root mass of the organism. And uh, last but not least, fungi uh, breathe in oxygen and emit CO2, just like animals do, which often throws people for six, actually. So... As we all know, plants breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen. So this is very much on the animal side here, just there. And of course, mushrooms don't need light at all. They don't contain chlorophyll. They don't photosynthesize. They get all of their food and their nutrients from breaking down compounds in the soil. Yeah, is everyone on board with me so far, yeah? Good to hear. So I'm not talking over everyone's head. Lovely. A little bit about the mushroom life cycle here. So obviously we all know we see a mushroom. This is the fruiting body. The mushroom contains drop spores. Now there's two families among the mushrooms. There's the uh, basidiomycetes, which are spore droppers. They are gills on the underside of their caps. They will just drop spores pretty much around the immediate mushroom. And acidomycetes, acicomycetes, which are spore shooters. They will attempt to fire them somewhere else. They often will not have the gills on the underside of the cap just there. So as those spores drop, they are looking to combine a male and a female spore. And this is a gross oversimplification because there are thousands of species of mushrooms that don't do this method. This is just the most easily observable one. There are some mushrooms which are male and female, some which are neither, some that are asexual and clone themselves, and some that have, if you want to put it in the terms of... Uh, as in different sex organs, I think one particular species has 28 different sex organs. There's different ways of looking at that as well. But basically, the two spores grow into hyphae. Male and female hyphae will meet and combine and begin to grow a base mycelium. Come the right time, that will grow into a hyphal knot, which is the baby form of a mushroom, then into a pinhead, then into a full mushroom, and the whole cycle will start again. So many spores don't travel very far, despite how long it's been since mushrooms first evolved. Uh, you're looking at a 30 centimeter average spore distribution in any certain area, unless they're caught by the wind or by animals, which is why many mushrooms have evolved such freakish adaptations to ensure their spores travel a little bit further. But yes, yeah, so that's why if a certain mushroom vanishes from a landscape, it will likely take hundreds of years for them to naturally travel again. Because so they're literally traveling in 30 centimeter increments to get back to where they need to go without intervention by humans or animals. And because humans, I do say this, are not the only species to have cultivated mushrooms. Uh, many species of ants do the same thing as well. They have mushroom gardens, they grow them help the spore dispersal, and they are, they, are, they are farming. They are farming the actual mushroom, which is absolutely insane when you look at it. Uh, so yes, what I also wanted to talk about here is, obviously, mushrooms are producing hundreds of thousands of spores. It's not a very successful way of breeding because of the hundreds of thousands, very few will meet and combine and actually grow into a new mycelium. But they, as they release their spores, many get caught up by the wind. You imagine a healthy forest, there's going to be millions of spores. These get swept up by the wind and form what we call cloud condensation nuclei. Basically, dust motes, spores, uh, skin cells, anything that can be swept into the upper atmosphere, which forms a small latch for water to condense on and then rain down with. So mushrooms affect the weather, is essentially what I'm saying here. The more mushrooms you have, the more chance you have of rain. And if you partner that with the basic physics of forests and trees, so obviously Forests and trees will take up water from the ground through their roots. They will grow. Some of that will evaporate and go up. And then as it rains, it will go down, go back up again, go back down, go back up again. And if you have a forest stretching from coast to inland, the trees, due to simple physics of the water cycle, will pull water further inland from the oceans where it rains most naturally on the coasts. And combined with fungus, that's why uh, rainforests are self-sustaining. It's a simple matter of physics. Once you uh, deforest an area enough, physics falters. It cannot continue the rain pulling cycle as it's currently doing. Then you have a full ecosystem collapse because there isn't enough rain to sustain the organisms and trees themselves. That's the current panic with the Amazon rainforest as it is approaching its tipping point if you take away too many trees, the Amazon will actually dry out and die out in its entirety, even without active logging. So that is a, a lovely bit of doom and gloom 
for you in this section. But yes, it's important to note the partnership between plants and fungi in this regard, because if you have a forest without a healthy fungal population, it won't pull in as much rain as one with the equal balance of the two. Uh, one thing to also note, especially in the UK, is the role of fungi in folklore, and this is related, I promise. So uh, if you've ever heard of fairy rings or fey circles, little circles of mushrooms where it's said if you step inside, you travel to the fairy kingdom. This is a myth that most co uh, coming from Ireland, uh, Wales and Scotland and in parts of, the, of England as well. Now, uh, there is a reason why these fungi grow in rings and it's a bit more mundane than the fey have come to steal you away. So these specific ones, they are what we call sophrotic fungi. They are decomposers. And say you've got a maybe a, a buried uh, squirrel or a rat, say a mere fox is buried as a snack for later, so that sort of thing. As that snack decomposes underground, you get the decomposing fungi, go, ooh, lovely, mealtime, and they will pop up over the corpse in question. And as the cycle goes on, they go, okay, we've got our mushroom, mushroom drops spores, we're going, there's no food left in the middle, so we're going to make all the spores drop and form little mushrooms around the initial site. They put out mycelium, they grow up into little spores, make a tiny ring, Time goes on, they drop more spores, and because the minerals have been deficient in the middle, they will search outwards and outwards for more nutrients, hence forming a ring around the buried body part. In a more dark way of looking at it, this is how the police can look for body dumps and decomposing matter under the earth, because grass will be a darker green colour as the fungi break down the nitrogen uh, present within the rotting body, and it is a clue as to anything buried underground. So uh, now you know. <laughs> so if you ever see fungi rings, chances are it is a mouse, a buried rabbit, something of that nature. But if there's a big one, you know, who knows? You know? <laughs> Make a call to your local police department and be that crazy person. All right, moving on to the next slide. So I mentioned earlier ways fungi have evolved to make themselves uh, more attractive to... Uh, to anything that would help spread their spores, basically. So one of the most ingenious ways they have thought of is bioluminescence. So obviously the, the typical way of something to glow, and uh, humans and bugs share a very basic brain cell called glowing things are pretty, let's go and have a look. Uh, insects will often land on something that's glowing, have a look around, realise there's nothing there of particular interest, and fly off somewhere else. But in doing so, they have picked up spores on their feet, body, and legs, and if they land on another mushroom or a particularly nice log or another section of soil, those spores could come into contact with the spores of another mushroom, spread in the same manner, and then spread through the forest that way. So through flies and insects, they have a little bit more range than the 30 centimeter spore drop that other species tend to use. This is also why a lot of mushrooms have a sweet smells, a sticky sap, anything that would uh, you know, make it interesting to an insect or to a mammal. Uh, truffles, which I always know are very expensive, are actually very pungent smelling because they're attracting wild boar. Wild boar will go, that's delicious. Come in, dig up the mushroom, dig, dig up the truffle, eat it, and then obviously defecate it out somewhere else. And that is part of the truffle life cycle. That's how they spread through a mammalian version rather than insects. But the three here I have included do glow in the UK as well. We have jack-o'-lantern, which are my personal favourite. They're absolutely stunning. Mycena are your classic little glowy green mushrooms, and bitter oysters glow as well. And it's worth noting in an area that has more uh, diversity of life, anywhere that's been more untouched, you're going to find more species of fungi just because they've been not as disturbed. That is usually where you'll find concentrations of our particular bioluminescent fungi as well. So west of Scotland, uh, the more remote regions of Wales, and southeast and west England. Uh, southwest England rather than east. That's very, very heavily populated at the minute. So anywhere that's basically healthier will have a higher chance of discovering these, which is lovely. And the oyster family is one I will come back to in a moment because the oysters have no right being as terrifying as they are. Okay, so it's time for the less uh, family-friendly version of how spores can reproduce. These are parasitic fungi. So these ones are uh, Fidio, cordyceps, and cordyceps, they are known as the zombie fungus. So what they will do, spores will drop down and infect a small arthropod, be it uh, ants, beetles, spiders, butterflies, all manner of insects like that. 
And what happens is they will basically take control of that insect and force them to wander outside of their range of habitat, normally up the trunks of trees onto young leaves. There it will force the insect to bite down and latch itself to that area, whereupon the sporing body will burst out of the insect's brain and drop more spores onto the forest floor and the cycle begins again. So there was a study done in 2017 by David Hughes that actually went, okay, how does this work? And the running assumption was the mushroom was taking over the insect's brain because obviously how else could it force it to walk? The mushroom doesn't know how to walk. It must be using the muscle memory within the insect's own, you know, own physiology. He was right, but he was also wrong, as it turns out. The fungus actually ignores the brain of the insect and grows within the exoskeleton and grows within the actual muscles present on the inside of the insect, uses that muscle memory, it forms a little network of its own and forces the insect to walk while the insect is still awake and aware of what's happening. So, yeah, it's more horrifying. The insect isn't dead. It's being forced to walk up and it knows exactly what's happening to it at the time. Yeah, no one ever said the fungal kingdom was nice, I guess. That is one way to get your spores around. Uh, Hollywood has actually made a little bit of an inroad into using this as inspiration for zombie films and games. I think Half-Life is the current zombie game that has a fungal zombie infection rather than a typical virus one or magic or what have you. But yeah, there's no evidence this would actually work on a large scale on mammals. It's just hyper specialized to work for insects which is a more secure bet if you're going to be entering in that niche because insects are so, insect populations are absolutely massive, especially in rainforests. So if you're going to, you know, infect anything, it may as well be a colony of ants several thousand strong rather than hoping one mammal wanders by and picks you up. So yes, that's the horrifying part of the, uh, the thing over. There we go. So one particular thing that I'm studying at the minute is the different kinds of fungi. They're split into four broad groups. So obviously we have our pathogenic or parasitic fungi. Those are the ones, obviously, fungal infections, things that will kill their hosts as they have their own life cycles. Things like a beefsteak fungus, which coincidentally uh, looks, tastes, smells, and uh, you know, it looks like a steak of beef growing out the side of a tree. It grows quite massive. If you ever see one of those, now flick back to the appropriate slide at the end of the lecture. But if you ever see one, steer well clear of that tree. That tree is coming down in the next five years. It's a, it's a killer. So when people are looking for uh, trees like ash, elm, things like that, if they see beefsteak fungus, that tree is on its way down. That's one of the things we're looking for in you know, forest work. Then you have endophytic fungi. So these are fungi that live within the tree itself. And fungi have a wonderful ability, a partnership ability, to flip between this, your own cells and the cells of plants without damaging the host cell. So that basically helps speed up uptake of gases and air, water, things like that. So these fungi, it's been proven that anything that lacks endophytic and mycorrhizal fungi, any plant does less well than those with those connections. It's basically the same function as the fungi in our own gut biomes. They're helping the trees digest and breathe, essentially. Going to that, we have mycorrhizal, which is the current uh, new uh, area of study. Mycorrhizal uh, fungi are those that form partnerships and live mostly in the soil. These fungi have partnerships with tree roots, essentially. So you think about it, a tree is made of wood. It's not the best conductive material. It is not the best at sucking at water, no matter how many fine filaments it has. Whereas fungi are fantastic at transferring, you know, base minerals, phosphorus, nitrogen, water and air. So in exchange for the fungi services of, hey, you need these things in the soil, we can happily provide those. The fungi will take a portion of the tree's natural sugars it makes through photosynthesis. It's a completely symbiotic relationship they have there. And any one tree can have up to 600 species of fungi in that mycorrhizal network around its roots, each one hyper-specialized for a certain area, which is absolutely fascinating and I love them completely. And then you have the saprotic fungis, which are very important. They are the decomposers. And these have to happen in stages. So we went through a phase in British woodland and landscape management where we thought if there's a dead tree or any fallen wood, we have to clear that away because it's untidy. And, you know, it could be disease ridden. We don't want it. It was done in the best of interests. We don't want it to spread disease to other animals or other trees. Turns out uh, when you remove all that dead wood and you remove the food for saprotic fungi, the saprotic fungi in that area die out. And then things decompose much slower and the forest takes a lot longer to get nutrients taken up in life returned to the soil, which is their entire point. 
and they must happen in phases. So phase one will break down a portion of the bark, phase two will break down the next portion, all the way down to breaking down lingin, that wood molecule that's very, very tough. And it will happen in any in between four and you know 50 stages for different fungi to appear. And uh, if one of those goes missing, as I say, it takes longer for those fungi to come back because of the aforementioned 30 centimeter spore distance. And now we're at a point of thinking, OK, we've deprived our woodlands of these decomposers in certain areas quite strenuously for about a century and a half. How do we fix it? We're now at that point in British landscape management, which currently, and we're doing a good job of it now, is leaving dead wood where it is and just letting what's already there do its thing. Because they've not died out completely in any area. I do want to say that. Those fungi are still there, just not as populous as they once were. So it is simply a waiting game to get them back to their former glory. But for the remainder of this lecture, we will be looking at the mycorrhizal fungi in this diagram. So if anyone's ever left uh, carrots in the fridge too long, you know, they've left potatoes around the back of the, uh, the cupboard and, uh, you know, just uh, noticed it's got, oh, it's got a film of unpleasant white gunk on it. That is the beginnings of the fungal, saphrotic and mycorrhizal network. So basically, you have the endomycorrhizae, which are the outside, they are the most, most populous of the two, and the ectomycorrhizae, which is inside the cell walls. They're not damaging the plant. Plants without the network, as I mentioned earlier, don't grow as quickly. They are often more stressed and they often lack energy reserves to deal with any extremes in temperature or disease. So they lack the energy to mount a defense, essentially. Whereas those with a network in partnership often have uh, simply grow faster, grow taller, have bigger roots, have bigger energy storage, and they are more able to deal with extreme heat, extreme cold, and any diseases or pests that might sweep through a woodland. So the mycorrhizal fungi do a very important job, and they're a very good thing we should encourage more in our natural landscapes. Uh, these networks, despite how vast they are, they are in the upper layer of soil, usually between in the first uh, meter and a half or so. The fungi actually don't have, well, the deeper down you go, the harder and tougher the soil gets, and they're only very, very faint and fleshy. Some of these are very fragile. They can't penetrate that deep down. And they are also very easily destroyed. So if you uh, plow a field, boom, that's the mycorrhizal network gone in that area, and it will take years for that to reestablish, which you can imagine in a country as intensely farmed as the UK is something we're catching up to very late in the game. That's not to say it can never come back. If you leave a field for two to three years, you'll start to see the network coming back with the fastest ones coming first and those coming afterwards. So it is fungi work very, very quickly in comparison to plants. It's not, it's not a, we've, you know, we've destroyed it all and we're all going to die situation. It never is. When it comes to this thing, a lot of people subscribe to doom and gloom. Um, I'm not one of those people. So yes, here we go. Next slide. So book wheel circles, these giant mycorrhizal networks are known as the wood wide web. And how they partner with trees is absolutely fascinating. So if you imagine you have several hundred trees in the same area, there will be fungi connecting between the roots of all those trees. Fungi are made of uh, chitin and more fleshy, so they're better conductors for electricity and for chemical compounds than straight wood is. And trees communicate chem chemically. So, you know, any smells produced, that is, you know, a chemical signal. If one tree gets infested with bark beetles, that tree is in distress. It's trying to mount its own defenses against the bark beetle. It will put out a chemical reaction, which is essentially a call for help and a warning to other trees in the area. That will travel quite slowly through the tree itself. But as soon as it touches the mycorrhizal network in the roots, the mushrooms go, hang on, we've got a message, and we just fire it across to all the trees in the area, regardless of species. So what we are noticing is that trees that have an issue on one side of a woodland Within two, three days, trees on the other side of the woodland have mounted their own chemical defences to halt bark beetle spreads that haven't even reached them yet. So they are communicating, in essence, which is absolutely fascinating. And if a tree is in distress for a long period of time, it has used up all its own energies, you would think that tree would die off and simply you know, let itself lie. Because those tree roots are interwoven and that network is mutually beneficial and supportive, because it is not as much dog-eat-dog -dog as you'd think, just a community, other trees will actively send excess sugars to the tree in distress to help it bolster its own defences and hopefully bring it back on its feet. And if it does die, which it does, it does die. However, you can find stumps of trees that are thousands of years old 
And if you get an axe and cut into that stump a little bit, why, when you would expect a wet, rotting wood on the inside, it's actually green like sapling wood because the other trees are still supporting that stump, even though now it is no longer a full-size tree, which is absolutely fascinating on my end. There's a lot of anthropomorphization uh, when it comes to forests uh, and you know, the tendency to go, oh, it's you know, a mother tree, a community and things like that. Well, and so we have to be careful. It's certainly not human. This is operating like a human brain on a scale we can't even comprehend. But there is a recognized community of forest organisms that actively benefit from working together in that instance. And trees do remember things. We have noticed this. So trees actively have a sense of time. Uh, they actually have to remember how long previous spring, summers and winters have been to know when to hibernate or to bloom. The trees remember damage. So they had a, uh, I can't remember which study this was, they had a rack of uh, young saplings and what they would do is every day at the same time two o'clock they would drop the rack and shake the plants and these were very quickly reactive and those plants would shrink into themselves as a form of defense to damage after about four weeks of this consistent you know knock on damage to themselves they found the plants would you know they'd go down they'd be shaken but they wouldn't actually curl into themselves because they recognized no damage would come after the fact so they would just stay open. So trees are, it takes longer than it does for animals, but trees and plants can remember damage and what to do in that situation. They're just operating on a time scale in the decades and the weeks rather than instantaneously like animals can. And then of course, there's the creepy ones that come back again. So you've had your feel good and now for the terrifying ones again. Carnivorous fungi exist. That was something I did not know until recently and I'm happy to tell you all about it now. So while it's true that many of the decomposing family will prefer a nice rotting log to set up shop on, uh, sometimes see the fact we've been tidying up our forests, there isn't enough energy for a particular fungus and they go, right, well, it's time to get meat on the menu. Now, there's about 200 recognized species of carnivorous fungus currently. Most of them are eating uh, very, very small micro life. So think more like uh, amoeba, amoeba, tardigrades, very, very small microscopic life as part of their consumption. Whereas bigger ones are going, hmm, I fancy a worm. And tree, so fungi speak uh, chemically. So when you're thinking of, well, the worms have no eyes, basically they're operating purely on smell. And the mushrooms can exude a smell or a scent that would lure the worms to their location. So it's usually a mating scent, I believe. And then while they're waiting for the worms, the mycelium, which is, as we know, the root system, can form sticky ring traps in a certain area that wait for the sensation of the worm to pass in. Once they sense the worm, they then constrict, trap the worm and bury in through the worm's mouth and anus while it is still alive and digest it from the inside out. There you are. There is your kind of spongy for you. The pictures I have here, this is the shaggy ink cap. This can be found all throughout the United Kingdom. That is a carnivorous fungus when the time strikes, as well as the entire family of oyster mushrooms, which you can find in your supermarkets and your Chinese, and they are very tasty. So yes, we, we are eating the, uh, the freaky carnivorous side of things more than you would often think. So in terms of uh, mushroom cultivation, as well as often been some uh, improvements, shall we say, or some very interesting discoveries. Uh, I don't know if everyone's ever tried shiitake mushrooms from Japan. They are delicious. Uh, so they're, the way they're grown is they have a rotting log and the gramas will obviously spore, wait for the mycelium to establish within that log and then smack it a few times to break the hyphal strands. The hyphal strands then go into reproduction mode early rather than waiting for a full mycelium on the log and produce mushrooms in a matter of weeks. And a current le a legend from Japan that's originated from the Middle Ages from shiitake farmers is that their stock would always grow better after a lightning strike, which seems like an old wives' tale. And then they decided to test it just recently. So uh, Koichi Takati at Iwata University, and I probably have pronounced that wrong. I tried my best there. Uh, discovered that running a high voltage current through the logs did predictably increase yield by about 30 percent, but wasn't sure as to actually why that would be the case. And it turns out, uh, so if you get a very high voltage strike, 100,000 volts, shall we say. Uh, true, nothing will survive in the immediate area of the lightning strike because that's a lot of energy concentrated into one place. However, what the lightning does is it causes essentially a shock wave. So it superheats the soil around it, which then obviously explodes. 
and that travels throughout the ground as the lightning con conducts down into the earth. That shock wave will break a much higher percentage of the shiitake haifei, and the, the mushrooms will essentially panic and go, oh my god, and then brute massively in the interim after a lightning strike. So there was actually truth in the myth there. So now they're trying to develop technology for mushroom growers throughout Southeast Asia and East Asia to uh, basically increase yield in that manner, which is fascinating, really. You wouldn't think uh, weather and fungus had such, an, such a connection, but uh, I'm very pleased to report that they do. And one thing I will show you after the live stream has ended is uh, being that mushrooms do pass electrical signals between each other through their hyphae and their mycelium. Uh, we have actually found out we can, in effect, listen to what they're saying to each other. Again, I run the risk of anthropomizing what they're saying. It's sort of like a nerve endings. So rather than language, they're probably sen sending uh, sensations such as touch, cold, pain, uh, you know, something friendly, something not friendly throughout their neural network. And I will show you the uh, video of that after the live stream where we can actually, all you need is a pair of crocodile clips, a synthesizer and an afternoon in the woods. And you can then listen to what the, the network is saying to each other, which is absolutely lovely. And it turns out that different species of mushroom do have different languages within themselves. So it'd be interesting if one day we could potentially listen to the entire forest floor and see what's happening under there. But I will go into that just afterwards. And getting to the end of it now, and I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Uh, but going into remediation, so what people, so remediation is basically using uh, natural sources to basically fix a landscape after intense pollution or damage. So bioremediation is often uh, planting trees and what have you in a, in a fire damaged landscape, for example. Uh, Mycoremediation is using fungus to actively break down parts of the soil that have been polluted heavily and will not support other more, more recent forms of life. And you might think, okay, it's a mushroom. What can the mushroom do, essentially? Uh, if it's an oyster mushroom, it turns out quite a lot. So what mushrooms do is they are basically uh, secreting enzymes that actively break down complex hydrocarbon chains. And in layman speak, that means it's able to break down complex uh, items and organisms into their base components, which is harmless, you know, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, things like that. Oyster mushrooms take this to the next extreme. Oyster mushrooms can eat petrochemicals, so oil spills. If you spin a tank of gasoline, oyster mushrooms can essentially eat that and form and happily form their own hyphae chain. They can eat heavy metals from mining pollution. They can eat uh, CFCs and pesticides from intense farm use. They can, they can basically eat almost anything. And there's many different species of mushroom that specialize in breaking down certain plastics, for example. So if you toss a plastic bag into one of these mushroom piles, it will happily, within eight to 10 weeks, break that down and eat it. And there are now advanced recycling plants using mushrooms as that base to sort of go, OK, here's how we can you know, break these down into harmless organisms. Um, they don't recommend, obviously, eating the mushrooms that are produced on this land. But to give you an example, I do have a link to uh, Paul Stamets' lecture here. Paul Stamets is a very legendary mycologist. He has been pushing many aspects of fungal research recently. Uh, so he has demonstrated on several examples and experiments on how fast microremediation actually is. So to paraphrase his lecture, he had uh, several piles of rubbish, essentially. So he had uh, soil mixed in with gasoline, mixed in with chemicals, pesticides, metals, and he had a control pile, which he did nothing to for obvious reasons. He then had one pile that had uh, advanced uh, decomposing bacteria. He had one pile that I think had viruses and another that had mushrooms and mycelium. He covered them all, left them alone and came back eight weeks later. And it's worth noting that every, obviously nothing happened to the control pile because nothing was done to change it. The three that had bacteria, viruses and what have you, Basically, nothing had changed there either. They were still horrible, stinky, sweaty messes. When he uncovered the mycelial pile, the mushrooms were bigger than most people's heads, and they had actively broken down the hydrocarbons into their base components within eight weeks. It was not a total fix, but it was a very significant fix compared to the other control piles. And so what he is piloting now are basically uh, just a, you know, rough, like a flower bags, basically, or hemp bags, things like that, 
full of sawdust and dirt and mushroom spores. And what they're trialling is if they build a small trench wall, maybe two bags high, at the edge of a field known to have pesticide on it and has uh, runoff. So in the UK, we have lots of pesticides use. Uh, and then if the field is on an incline, it rains, the rain washes the pesticides into the stream at the bottom, that then pollutes everything downstream. That's one of the major issues we have in this country. By building a small trench wall of these little hemp bags full of spores, the water has to filter through the spore bags and the mushrooms go, oh, pesticides for lunch, yay. They can then break down what's passed through the water and filter it so the water entering the stream is no longer as polluted as it once was. They're not claiming it's a total fix, but it's significant and critically cheap improvement on current pesticide use until the farmers can gain access to pesticides uh, once again that are less damaging. So yeah, that's the current area that I'm interested in. I'm looking for, I believe they're trying this right now in the new forest in England. There are plenty of uh, ex-farming sites that have been bought. They're obviously hoping the forest will expand into them, but they're using oyster mushrooms to clean up the pesticide use in that area of land. It's going to take about six years, the full project. And it's one I'm currently hoping to get involved with at some point. Uh, but yeah, you've heard me rattle on at you long enough. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. And does anyone have any questions? Thank you.